Hello and welcome to the New Order Review, your source for everything anime and manga, and today we are here with some more Jujutsu Madness for what I am told is the long-awaited Shibuya arc, which would appear to be a gigantic chaotic climax of the series to this point, and we're going to go through about half of it in this video, because I got to the point where the chapters started to have just insane titles like The Shibuya Incident, Part 27, and with no end in sight, I just, I just sort of needed to call it there. And that's because this arc really does confront you with an overwhelming amount of content, and to have a chance of properly dissecting it, I need to dump a load of thoughts right here, right now. And before I do, just a quick reminder that if you are an anime-only watcher and you've somehow stumbled upon this video, big, big spoilers are coming your way, so continue at your own peril. And speaking of peril, without a certain Gojo in the picture, your only hope of surviving this video is to activate the subscribe button for the New World View, thus granting regular injections of Jujutsu Kaisen morbidity administered straight into your YouTube feed. I really don't like your chances of survival without having press that button, so uh, let's just get on to it, yeah? But the premise of Shibuya thus far goes as follows. Mahito and Ko, perhaps better referred to as Mahiko, have enacted their grand scale plan to seal Gojo rather successfully and are proceeding to cause havoc in Shibuya. Ideally is phase one to rid the world of humanity and it's up to everyone who is not Gojo to stop them. Sounds quite simple, but it isn't. There's a lot of insanity being explored here from character interactions to advanced cursed combat and even the profound philosophical struggle of body and soul. Shibuya seems to come equipped with, you know, a little bit of everything. Even mecha style warfare, as we begin this arc with a three chapter battle between Mahito and Mechamaru, who has apparently constructed his own Evangelion unit, which I point out specifically because this ultimate Mechamaru takes clear visual and even functional inspiration from that franchise specifically. Not at all surprising because Akatami is a big fan of just sort of injecting pop culture everywhere he can, but this was quite a way to begin and the expanded nature of this singular fight really did set up the idea that we were in for quite a long haul arc. Previously, Jujutsu Kaisen has not really had a ton of specific fights that span multiple chapters solely focusing on them, at least ones that weren't arc climaxes. So this really did let me know that, yeah, we were gonna take our time here. And these three chapters also did a very good job of endearing me to Mechamaru before unceremoniously removing him from this world, or I guess at least most of him. It was quite touching to see his drive to just live with everyone. And from a narrative standpoint, what this fight accomplished was the beginning of the expiration of domains. So wow, uh, domains. Shibuya thus far has been more or less a masterclass of domain combat and functionality. What the Mechamaru aspect did specifically was expanding upon a previously installed idea of the simple domain and how it can even be used to counter a full domain. And that idea then went on to be extensively used by characters like Meimei's brother and even Naobito Zenin. Although his technique was, well, it was technically different to a simple domain, but it was the same general effect. But even with full domains, a massive aspect of Gojo's battle in this arc was domain mind games, the whole idea that Jogo cannot use his domain because that would force Gojo to counter with his domain. And this whole incident is just one big battle of pure tactics, which I love because these parts of a shonen series can sometimes drag out quite a bit with fairly boring mechanisms of battle that just consist of uh, summoning more power and like punching things. But Shibuya is actually quite complex and I'd be lying if I said I had a complete handle on everything that was happening at this stage. In fact, this is an arc where Akutami has even had to start making these fun little mini maps to keep us up to date with locations, characters, and even cursed mechanics. Like the whole idea that there were four curtains thrown up around the area simultaneously, each with different purposes. It really is not as simple as some sort of big world ending threat. There is an absolute ass ton of technicalities at play, which make me feel like these antagonists have really put some effort into this plan. Instead of doing something more narratively lazy, like gathering the, like, the magic rocks and then summoning a big power thing, you know, how it always goes. But with that, let's move to Gojo. As I think I've said before, his very existence is a problem, not just to our antagonist, but also to Akutami. Because for anything interesting or dramatic to ever play out in Jujutsu Kaisen, Gojo either needs to be absent or disabled, because that's the risk of making a character with his, frankly, absurd level of power. Having said that, the way in which he was taken out of the picture here was quite brilliant. It's not only clever, but satisfying, and also gave Gojo a lot of cool moments to act before ultimately being sealed in the prison realm. Oh, and of course it was also far from easy, even resulting in the death of Hanami, which was surprisingly sad. However, my favorite moment of this Gojo-centric conflict was this two-page spread, because you know what we almost never see in the entirety of the manga medium? Curved panels. Curves and circles are pretty commonly seen in Western comics, but these two pages kind of stunned me, because I'm really not used to seeing any kind of curved layout in manga. And I suppose one reason for that is because it does make the pages and atmosphere a lot more passive, whereas jagged and straight lines are much more action-packed and exciting. 
exciting. But even so, I love what Akutami does here because these curves form sort of like a visual sink with Gojo in the middle and all of the focus is flowing down straight towards him like water down a drain. I won't linger on it too long, even though I do really like these pages, but what I also enjoyed was the Gojo conflict instilled a very harsh sense of reality with Gojo accepting that he would not be able to save everyone, but promising vengeance in return, even accepting the damage that his own domain expansion would cause. And actually having said that, here's the thing, random tangent here, but what is going on with the English translation of Jujutsu Kaisen? In this arc, Gojo's domain is called an immeasurable void, but it was absolutely 100% called unlimited void the first time he used it way back in like chapter 15. Also, Fushiguro's Shadow Garden is now called a domain expansion instead of an area expansion. And I, I honestly don't care what they decide to go with, but would it be possible to maybe, just maybe stay consistent with stuff like this? Because using different terminology for the exact same mechanic makes me think that they're different mechanics. Like when I first saw Immeasurable Void, I thought it was, oh, it was a different brand of domain to Unlimited Void. So basically, get your crap together. There is really no excuse for mistranslating something that you've already established way, 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 way back in the series already. And like, I'd understand if there was a difference between the anime and the manga, in fact, I think there is, or like official versus fan translations. But when it comes to the fact that there are differences in just this one official product itself, it's kind of annoying. Anyway, moving on, we also have an answer to a question that I brought up reviewing the prequel, and it turns out that Gojo did kill Ghetto. Good boy, Gojo, I never should have doubted you. And I am really glad to know this. Reading the prequel with Ghetto's survival in mind was kind of off-putting, but this is not in fact Ghetto. Or is it? I don't know, there's questions, so many questions. One of which is one of the craziest questions that is currently being explored, which is challenging Mahito's philosophy of the soul shaping the body. We've now had a series of examples during this very hour where the body itself seems to fight the soul for control. This happened with Ghetto's body, but also with Toji's body and Toji, well, by the way, we will get to you. But this is a pretty fascinating and bizarre discussion that I frankly was not expecting to have. Because if you do believe in the concept of a soul, then it's such an accepted idea that goes along with that, that the body is nothing but a shell for said soul. But Jujutsu Kaisen is challenging that pretty radically by positing that the body and the soul may be entirely inseparable concepts, which is why we now appear to have a fully fledged Toshi Fushi Shiguro just sort of running about, doing his thing, which is terrifying. And also Jujutsu Kaisen just continues to spit in the face of my feelings regarding resurrections in media. Usually I would be cringing like uncontrollably at the very thought of bringing Toji back into the story after dying. However, Akutami is doing this very effectively by tying it to this whole body versus soul discussion and not just like a lame fan service -y resurrection because either the character was popular or the author didn't actually have the balls to kill them, which are the two main reasons why narrative resurrections tend to occur. So Toji is a very interesting X Factor presence right now, and that's where I ended this part of the Shibuya arc. Fushiguro and company were about to escape from here, the Cthulhu dude, I think his name is Dagon. Anyway, it doesn't matter. In pops Toji, so I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that's handled with the <laughs> father-son dynamic. But many, many other conflicts are occurring, several of which feature our plucky young Yuji, who is very much back into serious business mode. After hearing that Mahito was responsible for this, he immediately switch back up into that Junpei trauma with a straight up look of kill, kill, kill. So it feels like a setup for some pretty big Yuji drama happening here in the future. Although the most interesting conflict thus far is definitely his fight with Choso, which kind of blew my mind because we had a surprise repeat of the Toto situation. You know the whole, it was at this very moment that a memory was born inside Choso's brain of a past event that never happened. And that was wild. I legitimately thought that that was just a stupid but fun Toto joke, an event that was completely the result of his very odd brain thing, which is still odd, even though this isn't his doing. But now that it's happened again and under such a serious context as well, this is clearly some sort of like innate Yuji ability, yeah? Because we know it's not Sukun is doing because even he was surprised by what happened, I think. So I'm at a bit of a loss here because that was definitely unexpected, although it does serve as a nice contrast to what Mahito does, I suppose. You know, he manipulates the body via the soul, whilst Yuji is somehow capable of manipulating the mind, I don't know, maybe even by the soul. Because does manipulating the mind manipulate the soul? I don't know. Neither Toto nor Choso have been physically changed. But maybe this is the mechanism by which Yuji could effectively
effectively face off against Mahito without letting Sukuna take full control. And I'm just sort of assuming that Choso is now going to become an ally of Yuji, not entirely sure, but his brotherly bonds are so powerful that I don't think he'll be able to ignore this. And having briefly brought up Sukuna, Mahito seems to be playing a very dangerous game here. At the outset of the series, we were told that for this very plan to succeed, the one, the thing that we're doing right here and now, we needed two things. One, the ceiling of Satoru Gojo, and two, the cooperation of Sukuna. So Mahito is abandoning a whole half of this plan here, which I find pretty surprising considering he's experienced firsthand just how powerful Sukuna is. But that change of heart seems to be a potential key to salvation here. You know, not being saved by humanity's most powerful warrior of goodness and stuff in Gojo, but finding victory through the depths of Sukuna. Meanwhile, Meimei also has quite a bit of focus thus far alongside her little brother thing. Comedically, they were pretty amazing, but what really made me sit up and pay attention was their fight against the special grade disease curse, which had this, this sort of complicated domain thing going on. A series of three conditions, trapping someone in the coffin, burying it with the gravestone, and then a three second countdown. I find that sort of ability really, really fun to read because it adds this great extra layer to combat. I get bored very easily when it's just about, you know, hit the people with the powerful attacks. I prefer more strategic battles, which engage the mind as well, which is exactly what this is, as well as pretty much every other fight in the arc thus far. And another fun example of a tactical struggle would be against old moustache guy. I don't know his name. I don't remember if it was mentioned, but he had the inverse curse technique, where strong becomes weak and weak becomes strong. So Yuji and Fushiguro had to come up with a unique strategy to land the weakest possible attack on the old guy, but one that would still register on his scale. And that really is another step towards Jujutsu Kaisen becoming a bit more like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, where every battle presents a completely unique problem to be solved, which is not at all a bad thing. Oh, and since it doesn't look like he'll be too relevant going forward, let's also mention Ino right now. I legit thought that this guy was just going to be some sort of throwaway character that we may or may not see ever again, but it is nice to know that he's not as shallow as just wanting a title for the sake of it, and actually has a somewhat deep connection to Nanami, seeking his approval and such. Pretty cool curse technique as well, he just got very, very unlucky with his opponent. So as of right now, Shibuya is simply insane. It's very difficult to predict how the story is going to end, but I'm very much looking forward to seeing more from characters who were less featured thus far, like Kinomaki, who popped up towards the end of where I stopped, as well as Panda. Always Panda, more Panda now. There's a wealth of great character interactions left to explore, as well as an entire series climax to play out, so I'm, I'm gonna go and do that now. Because that pretty much does it for this half of Jujutsu Kaisen Shibuya Incident Arc, and what do you guys think? Please leave your thoughts in the comments below, or even join my Discord server, and if you're keen for some more Jujutsu Sorcery, then please do check out some of my other videos, or even subscribe to the channel for very, maybe regular Jujutsu Kaisen morbidity administered straight into your YouTube feed. But for now, this has been the New World Review, and I'll see you next time.